Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Exploring for the Future showcase. And this is the plenary session that we have um, today, which is this afternoon in Canberra. But I do realise that we have people in a whole lot of different locations that will be calling in. Thanks for joining us, no matter where you are. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce myself. My name is Steve Hill. I'm the Chief Scientist at Geoscience Australia here in Canberra. As I said, thanks for joining. It looks like we've got a lot of people that are currently signing in, so that's great to see. We've got a, a growing audience. We're, um, yeah, really pushing up there, so that's fantastic to see. Uh, and this afternoon promises to be the start of what will be a great showcase over the next few days where we can hear some fantastic um, work that's been going on, particularly the pre-competitive geoscience from across the country. Um, I'm currently speaking to you, as I said, in, from Canberra, which is Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. And just to kick things off in that area, I'd like to now share with you an acknowledgement of country. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and elders, past and present. At Geoscience Australia, we acknowledge that our mission to be the trusted source of Earth Sciences information is preceded by tens of thousands of years of knowledge gained by generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of that wisdom and of the lands, waters and skies where we work, live and learn. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are Australia's original mappers, miners and navigators. This is the heart of our work and we have so much to learn from their many thousands of years of related knowledge. Okay, terrific. That's a fairly new video that we've got uh, at Geoscience Australia and Exploring for the Future. And uh, it was fantastic to see that and a uh, great way to start things off. And I'd just like to extend a personal um, acknowledgement and welcome to any First Nations people that are um, joining in on this today. Great to have you and everybody else with us all together. We now move to a, um, an opening introduction from our Minister, the Honourable Madeline King, MP, who's the Minister for Resources and Minister for Northern Australia. Welcome everybody to the Exploring for the Future Showcase. I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we all meet. I'm recording this video in Canberra and would like to pay my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people tuning in today. I would also like to acknowledge Geoscience Australia's Chief Executive Officer, Dr James Johnson, Chief Scientist, Dr Steve Hill, its Mineral Energy and Groundwater Chief of Division, Dr Andrew Heap, and the Deputy Secretary of my department, Jane Urquhart. The showcase is an op important opportunity to talk directly with the scientists of Geoscience Australia in relation to the Exploring for the Future program. The combination of deep dive projects and potentially resource rich corridors in the east and the west, as well as continental scale projects and program support projects, demonstrate an exploration program that will grow our understanding of subsurface geology. The Exploring for the Future program is a very much a nation building program of which all Australians should be proud. The importance of Australia's mineral and energy resources industry cannot be understated. They are the engine room of our economy. Export earnings from the sector are expected to hit a record 419 billion in 2022 to 23. A steady stream of new resources projects is essential to our continued prosperity, but these projects do not happen overnight. It can take seven to 15 years from initial exploration and discovery to development and production. And they all start by knowing where to look. 
This is why the Australian Government recognises the value of geoscience and Geoscience Australia's leadership in this space. Through programs like the Exploring for the Future, Geoscience Australia is using cutting-edge technology and approaches to produce world-leading data and information about our mineral, energy and water resources. This data is accelerating the timeframes for resource discovery by narrowing the search space for explorers to highly prospective areas. Making the data freely available creates what is effectively an investment perspective, perspectives, providing our industries and our nation with a competitive edge. It is helping to create short, medium and long-term jobs for regional communities. It is allowing stakeholders, industry, landholders and governments to make informed decisions based on evidence. Crucially, it is helping to sustainably manage and harness the full potential of our natural resources, including groundwater, the lifeblood of our regions. It is exciting to hear about companies like Santos, Encounter Resources and BHP that are investing in new exploration off the back of the Exploring for the Future data. And I look forward to seeing these projects come to fruition. This work is only going to become more important for Australia as a key player in the world's transition to clean energy. Australia's abundant natural resources is one of our greatest strengths, as is our established world leading resources industry, which is operating from a platform of high environmental, social and governance standards. And of course, we boast a stable and reliable investment environment. According to the International Energy Agency, to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement, zero emissions by 2050 would mean a quadrupling of mineral requirements for clean energy technologies by 2040. Herein lies an incredible opportunity for us. Clean energy technologies such as wind turbines, solar panels, batteries and electric vehicles require a wide range of minerals and metals. As well as large critical minerals reserves like lithium and cobalt, Australia has a significant endowment of nickel, copper and bauxite that are essential for the production of these emerging technologies. Exploring for the future is playing a critical role in determining where potentially high levels of these resources lie in underexplored and unexplored areas of the country. And finally, the program is also helping identify future sources of energy, including hydrogen. It is supporting the sustainable development of Australia's emerging hydrogen industry by targeting, targeting potential commercial scale geological storage of hydrogen. And to conclude, I want to acknowledge that Geoscience Australia is responsible for the most interesting and talked about item in my office. It is a glorious, detailed and absolutely enormous map behind me that sets out in stunning detail the resources and resources infrastructure of Australia. It was commissioned by my predecessor as a member for Brand, the Honourable Gary Gray, AOMP, and this map has followed Labor Shadow Ministers for resources around our parliamentary offices since 2013. Now the map is back in the Resources Minister office and Geoscience Australia is undertaking the task of an update. 13 years of resources and infrastructure to include and I can't wait to see it. Again, I want to commend Geosciences Australia. The extraordinary work they're doing is ultimately helping to address key challenges facing the nation, energy and water security, transition to a net zero emissions future, national sovereign capability, regional economic diversification and development. I wish you the best in this uh, forum. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Minister. Isn't it great to hear from someone like so many people out there that are passionate about maps. And a good map really does explain and help us make a lot of uh, decisions. I'd now like to introduce uh, our next speaker, which is Dr. Andrew Heap. Andrew is the Chief of the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division at Geoscience Australia. He has 22 years of professional experience in leading geoscience research as a senior leader in Geoscience Australia, with a track record of successfully delivering energy and mineral, carbon capture, utilisation, storage, and marine geoscience and groundwater programs. Dr. Heap has responsibility for leading programs to build a national prospectus of Australia's mineral, energy, and groundwater resources using geological information. Andrew graduated with first class honours in geography from the University of Auckland. It's got in brackets here that that's in New Zealand, but I think many of us will, will know that. In 1996, 
and completed his PhD in Earth Sciences at James Cook University in 2000. Please, let's hear from Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for that kind introduction, Steve. Hello, everyone. As Steve said, I'm Andrew Heap, and as the Chief of the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division at Geoscience Australia, it is my great pleasure to officially open the Exploring for the Future program showcase for 2022. For those not that familiar with Geoscience Australia, our purpose is to be the trusted advisor on earth sciences to inform government, community and industry decision making. We support evidence-based decisions through information, advice and services, delivering earth sciences for Australia's future. Through our pre-competitive geoscience programs, we're building Australia's resources wealth and securing the nation's water resources. The work we undertake on behalf of the government is referred to as pre-competitive geoscience because it is at the earliest stage of information. It comes before private sector investment, not instead of it. Government investment in pre-competitive geoscience establishes fundamental information about the geography and geology of Australia that helps us to sustainably manage and harness the full potential of our natural resources. It acts as a prospectus, if you like, driving investment in resource exploration and creating jobs and growth opportunities, especially in regional Australia. It is also creating a pipeline of new projects required to support Australia's transition to net zero, grow, grow our green economy and help sustainably manage our environment. In my talk today, I'll focus on the value of pre-competitive geoscience to Australia. Beginning in 2016, the Exploring for the Future program is a $225 million investment over eight years by the Australian Government in pre-competitive geoscience. The program is building a comprehensive understanding of our national mineral energy and groundwater resource potential. The following short video describes the program in a bit more detail. Since 2016, the Exploring for the Future program has been transforming our understanding of Australia's geology. Using innovative tools and techniques to image, characterise and assess the subsurface, the program is supporting resource exploration, regional development and informed decision making across Australia. Today, the Exploring for the Future program is building a world leading national picture of Australia's mineral, energy and groundwater resource potential. The Australia's Resources Framework Project is delivering a national view of Australia's surface and subsurface geology. Extending fundamental national data sets and geological models and national mineral potential assessments and identifying economic fairways. The National Groundwater Systems Project is improving our understanding of Australia's groundwater resources to support responsible management and water security into the future. The Australia's Future Energy Resources Project is evaluating the potential for new energy commodities in Australia, including oil, natural gas and hydrogen, and technologies like carbon capture utilisation and storage to support the nation's transition to a low carbon economy. The Darling Konamona Delamarian project is delivering new data and knowledge to support water management along the Upper Darling River and to assess base metal and critical mineral potential across a vast area of southeastern Australia. The Officer Musgrave project is delivering new insights into geological processes to support water security for remote communities in the Musgrave province and evaluate the energy potential of the Officer Basin. The Barclay Isa Georgetown project builds on the first four years of the program, testing the undercover geology through stratigraphic drilling and delivering new data and knowledge to assess mineral and energy potential in undercover regions between Tennant Creek, Mount Isa and Georgetown. Our program support projects are improving the way we deliver and communicate our geoscience data and knowledge to our stakeholders. At its heart, 
The Exploring for the Future program is contributing to a sustainable, long-term future for Australia through an improved understanding of the nation's subsurface resources for the benefit of Australia. This diagram shows how the program activities and outputs you've just heard about are leading to tangible outcomes and impacts for Australians. Over the next two days, you'll hear from our program experts and leaders on a range of new tools and data, and the application of these to our growing understanding of Australia's geology, minerals, energy and groundwater systems, and the resource potential. My talk today will focus on the right-hand side of the diagram, highlighting the outcomes and impacts pre-competitive geoscience is having in meeting government priorities. While perhaps not immediately apparent, pre-competitive geoscience is delivering on each of the government priorities shown on this slide. I'll share some case studies on the priorities, demonstrating that the pre-competitive geoscience model works. World events are having a big impact on the cost of living in Australia, with food prices particularly affected. Australia's agricultural sector is a significant contributor to our economy and global food supply. Yet until very recently, we have been reliant on potash imports for use as fertiliser. Our reliance on imports has reduced and will continue to do so with the establishment of a new potash industry in Australia, propelled by a pre-competitive study undertaken by Geoscience Australia in 2012. The study was originally focused on studying the water, groundwater and soils of Australian salt lakes for their potential to supply lithium, a key mineral in batteries. However, unlike in Chile, it turned out Australian salt lakes don't contain lithium. But what they are rich in is potash, and not just any potash but sustainably produced sulphate of potash, which is a premium form of fertiliser. We know this because our pre-competitive geoscience studies focus on assessing a broad range of resources. That's important because, as this case study shows, you don't always find what you're looking for. Our report, published in 2013, resulted in a major shift in exploration focus by industry to potash. And in the words of Karen Patterson, CEO of Trig Mining, Geoscience Australia's Salt Lakes report has underpinned the development of Lake Throssell and in fact the entire potash industry now merging in Western Australia. According to the Australian Securities Exchange, or ASX, the reported geotable potash resource across Australia is worth just shy of $100 billion. With commercial production commencing in 2021, the Australian potash industry has just come in time, given recent global events have caused potash prices to almost double. Without Australian government investment in pre-competitive geoscience back in 2012, we wouldn't be able to pivot and identify domestic sources of potash supply today and be on their way to self-sufficiency. Understanding Australia's mineral potential is important to support our transition to net zero emissions by 2050. Clean energy technologies require a wide range of minerals and metals, including critical minerals. Some forecasts predict up to a five-fold increase in demand for metals like copper and nickel, which are key components of numerous low emissions technologies as illustrated on the right-hand side of the slide. Australia has significant endowments of many of the metals, including critical minerals, essential for the production of these emerging technologies. As well as large critical mineral reserves, Australia has significant endowments of nickel, copper and bauxite. This represents a unique opportunity for Australia to be a trusted and reliable global supplier of these in-demand resources. Even with known strong demand for critical minerals, pre-competitive geoscience is needed to stimulate private sector exploration investment to locate new mineral deposits and generate that pipeline of projects needed to maximise the benefit to our nation. For example, in 2014, Geoscience Australia undertook the first ever national multi-criteria mineral potential assessment of nickel copper platinum group element deposits, a globally significant but underrepresented style of mineralisation in Australia. Guided by previous studies published in the international literature into how such deposits form, we generated predictive maps derived from all of the available data and combined them to make a heat map of mineral potential. The report and prospectivity map on the left revealed several high potential areas shown in red, including about 70 kilometres northeast of the city of Perth, the capital of Western Australia. When we first presented this work publicly, there was scepticism from many that an undiscovered deposit could be so close to the city of Perth given the 1970s nickel boom in the region. Two years later, these outputs, along with pre-competitive data sets and legacy exploration information held by the Geological Survey of Western Australia, was a catalyst for Chellis Mining, a junior explorer at the time, to pick up the ground in the area. Fast forward to 2020, and the first drill hole at Chellis' Julemar project became the discovery hole for the world's largest palladium, platinum, nickel, copper, cobalt and gold discovery in the last 20 years. 
propelling Chalice to an ASX 200 company. Making a mineral potential map is a far cry from a discovery, so we congratulate Chalice on their success. Nevertheless, this story speaks to the value of pre-competitive geoscience in attracting exploration, narrowing the search space for explorers and accelerating the discoveries needed to support our transition to net zero emissions by 2050. Based on the assumption that the Gonneville deposit at Julemar becomes a mine, every dollar invested by government has been estimated by Asil Allen Consulting to generate at least $1,000 and as much as $1,500 of additional benefits to the economy. That's a pretty good return on investment in my book. In addition to the value of the deposit, the success of Chalice's Julemar project has sparked an exploration rush to the region by other companies. The final report from Asil Allen Consulting which is based on the latest resource numbers recently published by Chalice, has been released online today and can be accessed via the reference at the bottom of the slide. Investment in pre-competitive geoscience also gives us options for securing our future energy supplies. As part of the Exploring for the Future program, we've been studying the hydrocarbon potential of the South Nicholson Basin, which spans the Northern Territory and Queensland borders. This is a reflection seismic profile, most of which was acquired across the basin in 2017. Like an ultrasound to image inside your body, the seismic profile shows the different rock layers inside the earth down to about 15 kilometres below the surface. The prominent saucer shaped depression in the middle of the profile is the previously unknown Carrara subbasin. It's remarkable that in the 21st century we are still discovering major geological features in Australia we didn't know existed. It highlights how much more there is left to learn about our continent and the earth beneath our feet. The discovery of the Carrara subbasin triggered a major energy company to invest in exploration tenements to explore across the basin. A junior exploration company also recognised that the rocks that host the Century Zinc Mine in Queensland, a world-class deposit, continued westward, coming to within exploration depth on the other side of the Carrara Subbasin in the Northern Territory. This led them to invest in mineral exploration tenements along the basin's western margin, a move highlighting the value of considering how geology crosses state and territory boundaries and the value Geoscience Australia plays as a national geoscience organisation. This was an excellent outcome, since the purpose of the seismic profile was to assess the energy and mineral potential of the region. But to do this rigorously, we needed to samples of the basin rocks. Partnering with the Mineral Exploration Cooperative Research Centre, or the MINEC CRC, we drilled the National Drilling Initiative Carrara One Strategic Well through the subbasin in 2021. The well hit vugs of oil and other hydrocarbon indicators in the basin, demonstrating that there was an active petroleum system in the region. Dating the rocks also confirm rocks in the Northern Territory are the same age as those that host the Century Zinc Mine in Queensland. Confirmation of this relationship sparked interest from a global major minerals explorer, who entered into a joint venture with a junior company providing vital capital for an ambitious exploration program. To manage our precious water resources, basin-wide water management plans need to have reliable information on groundwater and surface water interactions. As part of the Exploring for the Future program, we completed a project focused on the Upper Burdekin River catchment in North Queensland, which supports pastoralists and farmers, groundwater dependent ecosystems, natural springs and the water supply for the regional town of Charters Towers. Our study was focused on the headwater region, which includes 40 million year old lava fields with volcanic centres, as shown on the left hand side of the slide, using a high resolution digital elevation model. Combining Queensland stream monitoring data with new hydrochemistry data collected in our study, the team identified that the highly heterogeneous lava fields supplied 60 to 90 percent of the water flow to the Burdekin River in dry periods, with recharge of the lava fields controlled by intermittent major recharge events. This example highlights how interlinked the groundwater and surface water systems are in the region, and how important it is to manage them as a connected system. Queensland water authorities are now using this information to develop a sustainable water management plan for the region. So far, I have shared examples focused on how specific new pre-competitive data and knowledge have informed decision making. Now I want to share with you an example of how we're working to transfer that geoscience data and knowledge into applications all decision makers can use. In this case, the economics of hydrogen production. Hydrogen production is influenced by many different factors, shown on the left hand side of the image all of which change spatially across Australia. For example, solar and wind capacity is not equal everywhere, and carbon dioxide cannot be stored everywhere. Working with Monash University, we have developed an online tool that calculates net present day value for a potential hydrogen project 
given a set of input instructions which the user can vary. The map shows an example of a model output with darker red areas indicating higher economic potential for hydrogen production. The tool is informing development and implementation of our hydrogen policy and helping the private sector to assess exploration and investment opportunities across Australia. The result is strongly influenced by the current distribution of infrastructure, such as the railway line across the Nullarbor Plain. Using our open source code, users can assess how the resource potential changes with new infrastructure, a particularly useful feature in assessing potential development of marginally economic minerals projects. This capability can be adapted to supporting future infrastructure planning more broadly across Australia. Now, I want to turn our attention to the economy and the mining sector more broadly. The mining sector is the backbone of the Australian economy. It accounts for over 10% of GDP, employs over a quarter of a million people, and is forecast to account for over $419 billion in annual export value in 2022-23. But we cannot take this for granted. Our world-leading mining sector requires ongoing exploration success to provide the pipeline of resource projects to develop. The graph on the right shows that Australia's share of global exploration expenditure fell from a high of 23% in 1993 to, to a low of just 8% in 2015. The long-term exodus of investment from Australia was largely driven by the view that Australia was a mature exploration destination, where all the rocks that could host a mineral deposit had already been explored, with nothing left to find. We, alongside others in government, academia and industry, didn't share that view. Since 2012, we've been part of the Uncover initiative, focused on articulating the opportunities for exploration undercover and the need for pre-competitive geoscience to unlock this exploration frontier. It's hardly a lucky coincidence that the rise of Australia's share of global mineral exploration since 2016 aligns with the start of the Exploring for the Future program, which has already revealed new resource potential in undercover regions. It's clear perceptions and practice by industry have changed. So, where's all this exploration activity? This map shows those new and reinvigorated resource exploration tenements granted to industry since 2016 that were stimulated by Geoscience Australia's pre-competitive geoscience. New activities are occurring over 276,000 square kilometres based on our work. That's an area larger than the landmass of New Zealand. Many of these are targeting critical minerals, shown in green. There was a concentration of tenements in the central eastern northern territory and northwest Queensland which, as I've shown, was a focus of our work in the Exploring for the Future program between 2016 and now. The concentration of tenements in southwestern WA was sparked by the Nickel Copper Platinum Group Elements potential map and the Julemar project discovery I mentioned earlier. I've told you how wonderful the program and pre-competitive geoscience is, but there's nothing like hearing it from those stakeholders who benefit from our data and information. Encounter has a long history of project generation and exploration. As a result of the Exploring for the Future program, Encounter now has a large presence in the Northern Territory. The Exploring for the Future hydrogeochemistry data was instrumental in the securement of the Elliott project. BHP has now partnered with us at the Elliott project through a $25 million earn-in and joint venture agreement. Our foundational data set that was of most use was the South Nicholson and Barclay Seismic Exploring for the Future data. Just last month, we announced that we have entered into two new farming agreements with South 32 at our Jessica and Carrara projects in the East Tennant and South Nicholson regions. The understanding of a new geological province undercover in the Northern Territory is no small task. As a result of this extensive pre-competitive data, the Territory is now at the forefront of copper exploration in Australia. Barclay Hardware JV Proprietary Limited, as it's known, is, is half owned by Delilah Curry Council Aboriginal Corporation and by Centre Corp, which is another organisation that are based in Alice Springs but invest through the Northern Territory. We've found that uh, we've had probably in total five or six mining companies have come to Tennant Creek to do various sort of work or exploration. I would say four of those have, have taken up and set up accounts with us with the hardware business. You know, that's extra business for us. So we've been happy with that. Plus the other ones that haven't set up accounts have still been coming into the hardware store anyway and to purchase items and, and things like that. The Department of Planning and Environment have taken the opportunity to co-invest in Geoscience Australia's 
Upper Darling Floodplain Survey Program. We could see the program had potential to help us improve our understanding of groundwater and its complex interactions with the Darling River in the area. Additional data will be collected around the Upper Darling Salt Interception Scheme, which helps keep salt out of the Darling River. The survey is almost complete and we look forward to the insights we can gain from the data. Bridgeport really welcomed the opportunity to assist Geoscience Australia in, it, in its initiative to investigate the enhanced oil recovery potential of the residual oil zones of Australia's discovered oil fields. The study uh, is a, a first for any Australian government and a, uh, an overdue first for the oil and gas industry of Australia. The project will complement Bridgeport's plans to recover additional green Mooney oil reserves by injecting large volumes of CO2 that would otherwise be vented to the atmosphere and adding to uh, Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. Activity is one thing, but just how successful has this resurgence in Australian exploration been? Over the last five years, there have been 20 Tier 1 and Tier 2 mineral deposits discovered around the world. An example of a Tier 1 deposit is Olympic Dam in South Australia, or Broken Hill in New South Wales, whereas the Tier 2 deposit is akin to many of the gold deposits in the eastern gold fields around Kalgoorlie in Western Australia. A total of 35% of those deposits were discovered in Australia. This includes two of the four Tier 1 deposits Julemar and Hemi, both of which were underpinned by pre-competitive geoscience. Overall, two-thirds of Australia's discoveries were underpinned by pre-competitive geoscience. Given Australia's share of global exploration expenditure, it's clear we are outperforming the rest of the world, and pre-competitive geoscience and programs like Exploring for the Future are key contributors to that success. This success does not come from working in isolation. It is the result of the close-knit geoscience community across Australia. We greatly value our collaborations across Australian, state and territory governments, cooperative research centres, national collaborative research infrastructure strategy partners and academia. Thank you and I look forward to continuing our collaborations. I trust I've convinced you that pre-competitive geoscience has proven its worth and is bringing about a step change in our understanding of Australia's mineral energy and groundwater resources. Specifically, I see the journey we are on as leading us towards integrated, holistic, multi-scale and multi-resource assessments to inform decision making by government, community and industry. In that vein, I'm very pleased to formally release another 13 extended scientific abstracts to add to the 63 released from the program in 2020. These provide excellent short format summaries of the many scientific aspects of the Exploring for the Future program and I encourage you to peruse them all. So if you want to know more about the program, I encourage you to browse our revamped website and explore the data discovery portal, which includes decision support tools like the Hydrant Economic Fairways example I showed in my talk earlier. Thank you for your attention today. I'll now hand you back to Steve to continue with our showcase. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Andrew Heap. It was great to hear all of that. Lots of things that I'm sure we're going to um, call back to, uh, particularly in the next little bit of discussion. We've got a little bit of time available, Andrew, if you're willing to take um, any um, questions or any discussion points that um, people might like to raise. And I invite those that are listening to, um, to put any questions or comments uh, into the chat of this meeting to um, have them read. I just noticed Carol has also um, put up the um, the link to be able to access Andrew's slides um, and presentations. So if you wanted to um, hear that again or pick up on a particular bit that might have um, just been a little bit quick for you, such as some of those fantastic Ace or Allen figures that are now um, that are now publicly available, um, that's the link there to be able to do that. So thanks for that, everyone. Um, just while we wait for a question, Andrew, I might just invite a comment from you. That it was great to hear that, of course. And you you said a little bit at the end about where the future might take us. Um, would you would you like to say a little bit more about what you think might be next? Thanks, Steve. Excuse me. I hope everyone can hear me okay. So um, that's a great question, and thank you for for that. Um, look, I think as I mentioned, 
the way the science is heading is towards that integrated resource assessment. Um, I think we are moving beyond individual assessments for perhaps minerals in one area, uh, energy for another area, and maybe water another area, because the types of questions that are being asked uh, for a variety of stakeholders are these integrated complex questions about, you know, what, how can I use this land? What's under this land? What can I you know, uh, utilize it for? And I think that the geology is fantastic because it helps answer all those questions. And so, and so I think what we want, what we're, what we're seeing in, in Geoscience Australia is a, is, a, is a move towards understanding in the same packet, same three-dimensional area, what are the resources for water? What are the resources for energy? What are the resources for minerals? And what are the other resources for uh, other things as well? So it's about bringing all that information together, using the geology as sort of the container, not only physically, but also conceptually in terms of information, and then bringing that to the fore and delivering it in a way that everyone can consume easily. Um, and then I think the next thing too, obviously, once you have that information, is then being able to use um, uh, decision support tools like the economics fairways tool I, I demonstrated for other commodities. So we've done one for hydrogen. We'll also, we're also working one on ones for critical minerals and working one on ones for uh, groundwater. And so I think moving into that space as well is really important. So that's, I guess that's where I see it going in the next few years. Yeah, it's great to hear about that, Andrew. I think that's what everyone, I think that's a, it's a pretty quick and immediate response to hearing about all the great work, the value of pre-competitive geoscience and think, well, yeah, but what's the future going to hold? So it was great to hear a bit on that. I'm sure we'll, we'll come to, back to that uh, a little more, particularly once we open up into a panel discussion in the next little bit. Looks like everyone out there is a little bit shy or they're um, overwhelmed. Um, we don't have a great flow of questions coming through. Perhaps not surprising, people are still warming up um, and getting engaged with all of this. And as I said, I think particularly for those opening talks that things are fairly um, high level. And I'm sure that as, as that now sets the scene for us to burrow in, I think we'll get a lot more coming through in the next little bit. But um, as I said, just the plug there for where you can access Andrew's slides and a recording of that talk. And also I see Laura has now put up a link to that ASIL Allen report, which is actually a fantastic segue into the next part of our um, session here, where we'll go to the panel and we'll talk a bit more about the value of pre-competitive geoscience and the, and the impacts of it. And I must say that those ASIL Allen figures are incredible. You know, they're just, um, you know, I guess, in, you know, in my past, I've been involved in some of these economic return studies. Um, and we have traditionally come up with much more modest figures than that. Andrew, maybe just one last comment from you about those figures. They're, they're, they are amazing. And um, what was what was your perspective on when, when you first saw them? Oh, thanks, Steve. Yeah, look, I think they are amazing. I mean, I think it just shows the value of, well, certainly the resources industry to Australia, uh, but also, like I said, the importance of the pre-competitive geoscience and for a modest investment by government, there's a large, large return. I think um, by any measure, any uh, major uh, discovery is going to be uh, transformational uh, for not only the country, but, you know, for the industry itself. And, and I think uh, it's something we want to continue to uh, demonstrate. Um, I think I think the thing that those numbers are great. I think the other thing I'd like to, to point out is is the the whole establishment of the potash industry. I think for me that was that was really important just in and of itself. It demonstrates that through the uh, science you can actually move you know create a whole new industry in Australia. And I think that's something that that really shouldn't be you know underestimated in the in the value and the importance of that. So so for me those two things are really really demonstrating. Um, why pre-competitive geoscience is so important. And, and, and I guess what we're seeing as a result of those numbers being published and that establishment of the new industry and those new discoveries, is many of our overseas competitors, let's say, or overseas colleagues in, the, in different countries are now emulating what we're doing here in Australia by implementing their own programs. And so we've got to think, what, how do we stay ahead of the game? And that's a challenge for us as, as a geoscience agency. But at the same time, we want to obviously work with them to make sure that um, you know we're making the best of um, the global scientific knowledge that we can apply here in Australia and apply those those, those new knowledge and new techniques from overseas and, 
and bring them to Australia so we can we can push ahead and make it uh, even more successful. Yeah, no, terrific, Andrew. Just had one question in and um, just better late than never with the question. So uh, Anna Petz from uh, South Australian Geological Survey has asked, uh, Andrew, what has been the biggest hurdle in these first stages of the EFTF projects? And I guess she comes from, you know, state government and, and always great to hear the successes, but also always an interesting perspective to hear perhaps how you might reflect upon what have been some of the challenges. Uh, thanks, Anna, for your question. I can say working with the states has never been the biggest hurdle. It's been great, and you've and uh, South Australia particularly has been really good, good to us, and uh, and that's fantastic. Um, look, I think one of the biggest hurdles we face is where do we start? Like where, where did we actually start doing the work? There's so much potential out there, and as I as I said on my speech, we've been working with the Uncover Initiative for some time, and that that gave us some fantastic leads, but also it, it also opened up so many questions. So the biggest hurdle for us really was a scientific one, which was where do we start, where do we focus the science and how do we actually make that happen? And, it, and it, I think there's been a lot of work working with the states and territories and getting their information together and understanding where their priorities are and where that aligns really nicely with what the national priorities might look like from a federal science agency. And there's been some fantastic alignment there. So, so getting things up and running once you've got the science sorted out, I think was one of the, one of the biggest hurdles we face. That's great. And uh, I don't think Anna did ask that. I don't think Anna asked that question to hear how good it's been to work with the states, but it's, I'm sure she's delighted that you started off your answer with that bit. But I, it's very true and good to hear. Andrew, thanks for making yourself available for um, some discussion following your excellent presentation. Um, I will let you go um, from, from the stage now. I can detect a slight croak in your voice. I know. There's plenty of things going around at the moment. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, we'll now head towards the panel, but thank you, Andrew. Thanks everyone. Okay. So everybody, we now have a panel discussion and we've pulled together a great group of people to be able to just more informally discuss some of the work and um, that exploring for the future and, and that broader area of of pre-competitive and government geoscience has, has been able to include. And I think this is a great way to start the showcase. We're going to have um, this sort of unscripted, um, you know, free and uh, informal discussion, because I think from that, a whole lot of themes and ideas come out and really stimulate those next few days of presentations that we have as well. So let me start by introducing our panel members. Um, so firstly, we have Dorothy Close, and um, apologies if I do sometimes refer to Dorothy as Dot. I think everybody knows Dorothy as Dot, but um, I will do my best, Dorothy. And so um, Dorothy Close is the Director of Regional Geoscience at the Northern Territory Geological Survey. Uh, she's a director, oh sorry, she's a geologist with over 20 years of experience of working across the diverse geology of the Northern Territory. She joined the Northern Territory Geological Survey in 1995 as a regional mapping geologist and currently holds the position of Director Regional Geoscience, overseeing regional geoscience and prospectivity assessment projects, and um, which is an immensely rewarding job in her words, and uh, I'm sure it is. Thanks for joining us, Dot. Thanks, Steve. Pleasure to be here. Uh, we also have David Close, and David is the Vice President of Operations and External Affairs at Tambaran Resources. David holds a PhD from the University of Oxford and a BSc from the University of Tasmania. David has worked in a range of interesting basins across the USA, Canada and Australia, but his favourite plays are the Proterozoic Shales of Northern Australia, where he has focused for the last decade. David has developed expertise in exploration and appraisal strategy, unconventional resource exploration and evaluation and quantitative seismic interpretation. Thanks also for joining us, David. Thank you very much, yeah, pleasure to be here. Good on you. We also have Tanya Constable. 
and Tanya is the Chief Executive Officer at the Minerals Council of Australia. She joined the Minerals Council of Australia, or the MCA, in July 2018, where she is proud to promote and advocate for a strong, vibrant, vibrant and innovative minerals industry in Australia. Prior to this, Tanya was Chief Executive Officer of the Collaborative Research Centre for Greenhouse Gas Technologies, or CO2CRC, which is a leading global research organisation testing carbon capture and storage low emission technologies in Australia. She was awarded the Public Service Medal in 2014 for outstanding public service in the development of Australia's liquefied natural gas and other resource and energy industries. Thanks also for joining us, Tanya. Great to be with you, Steve, and hello, everybody. Good one. Lastly, but by no means least, there's no order to this at all. Let me assure you, Craig Simmons. So Craig is a leading groundwater scientist recognised for major contributions to groundwater science, science leadership, education and policy reform. Craig is Matthew Flinders, is the Matthew Flinders Distinguished Professor of Hydrogeology, the Schultz Chair in the Environment at Flinders University and Foundation Director of the ARC National Centre for Groundwater Research and Training in Australia. From July 2020, he's been seconded to the Australian Research Council in the role of Executive Director for Mathematics, Physics, Chemistry and Earth Sciences. Craig is a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, the Australian Academy of Technology and, and Engineering, and the American Geophysical Union. He is a lead author of the United Nations World Water Development Report, known as Groundwater Making the Invisible Visible, and co-author of the IPC6 Assessment Report. Thank you, Craig. Great to have you with us. Great to be here. Hi, everyone. Good. Oh. So we've got four fantastic panel members and really importantly, four uh, panel members that are coming from different parts of our industry and also dealing with different commodities and, and um, resources in that area. So that's a fantastic spread. Um, so let me start off with a question and I'll just I'd like to just move through the panel with this. And this is a bit of a warm up and then we'll take it from there. I'm going to start with you, Tanya. So you'll have to do the, the quick thinking here. Um, just thinking about the the role of pre-competitive and government geoscience, but particularly pre-competitive geoscience, what has been the biggest impact that you've seen? When when you're speaking passionately as you do, Tanya, what are what are the things that really come to mind as a big a big case for having government groups such as Geoscience Australia doing this sort of geoscience? Thanks, Steve. Uh, look, I I can't underestimate the value of pre-competitive geoscience programs to Australia. And I think that the minister and Andrew really capably spelt that out across a whole range of areas. But the biggest thing for our industry is it de-risks. And the mining industry is all about de-risking. And, uh, you know, Australia is a big place. Uh, so these pre-competitive geoscience programs, they've been incredibly successful at narrowing down the search field to identify the best exploration targets across Australia. And Andrew really pointed some of those out. Uh, importantly, uh, investment is so critical to greenfield exploration in Australia and attracting more investment will boost the capital stocks that Australia needs and in turn uh, increase productivity across a whole range of sectors. So, you know, that has flow on effects right across uh, right across the uh, uh, the economy. So just going back just uh, to the greenfield exploration. Andrew talked about some of those newer minerals coming forward and, um, and importantly, 
you know, there has been a focus on critical minerals over the last little while, but uh, but within that, and I think the, the whole case for critical minerals needs to be broadened, that, that definition needs to be broadened out to nickel and copper, because that's where we see the biggest need if we're going to really fire up um, a, a pathway through to net zero emissions by 2050. So the copper story should be a big one for Australia. I think we're underexplored. Uh, we need to do a hell of a lot more in Australia and the pre-competitive geoscience programs are important. I want to make an upfront plug. This is something that uh, the Australian government needs to make permanent. There is no excuse for a program just to uh, to occur every four years and to go with a begging bowl back to government for permanent funding. This should be, it is critical to the industry. It's critical to a whole range of industries across Australia and pre-competitive geoscience needs to be permanently funded. Great comments, Tanya G. There's a lot in there. I should, um, I should also say, I, it was very remiss of me not to mention at the start that um, as the discussion goes on, please don't feel um, too inhibited for those that are listening out there with your comments. And, and if you'd like a particular question to be to be raised, um, where we will be looking at that screen. That's why I keep looking off to the side, just to check the screen um, to see if there's any comments and questions that we can pick up on. Um, so please, um, don't be shy to be forthcoming there, but no, great, Tanya, we'll come back to some of that and particularly that um, awakening and, and urging of governments to be, um, to provide that ongoing support is a really, that's a big, a big, a big area. Uh, let's go now to you, Dot. Sorry, I, I startled you, Dot. You didn't expect, you, you are on a panel, Dot, and uh, you're not watching this, so you are going to be asked for a comment every now and then. Um, so, Doc, do you have any comment or uh, around that, you know, really that some of those key advantages of pre-competitive geoscience? You have to talk about that a lot. Yes, thanks, Stephen. I, 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 was, I was only startled because I was wondering what the order of rotation was going to be. And I thought, <laughs> so I'm delighted to be after Tanya. Um, look, yes, uh, from a state survey or state or territory survey's uh, point of view, we, we hold a similar role to Geoscience Australia. Pre-competitive geoscience is our bread and butter. And, and to um, affirm Tanya's point, the, the purpose of that pre-competitive geoscience is to de-risk and stimulate exploration in our jurisdictions and also to provide evidence-based um, support to decision-making to government. So, so the value of that pre-competitive geoscience is enormous. I think the, the role that surveys play, and Geoscience Australia is key to this as well, is the consistency of that pre-competitive geoscience data. What we do uniquely um, as surveys, and including Geoscience Australia, is we we provide consistent data sets that uh, should be um, com complementary across our borders and provide the basis by which uh, anyone who's interested in understanding the geology or the resource potential can look at that data consistently and target the way they want to explore for their commodity of choice. So that is um, the intention of, of what the pre-competitive geoscience data is, is to provide that um, platform by which um, it de-risks and stimulates exploration. I think the next, um, just to follow on a little bit from what the challenges that um, Andrew was talking about before, the challenges going forward is making all this incredible amount of high value data much more accessible, broadly accessible to as many um, people as possible so that, that data gets used um, multiply for anybody to use. So the we're all following the principles of fair data to make it findable, accessible, integratable and reusable. And that's going to be our biggest challenge going forward. And we need to provide it on um, um, agnostic platforms that can be machine or person uh, interrogated. So, so pre-competitive data needs to get out there and be available to everybody. The, the surveys and Geoscience Australia will interpret the data in our own space, but the data needs to be out there on its own for everybody to use. And I think the investment that government puts into this pre-competitive data and getting it out is what's driving these next phases of exploration. I think that's um that's that's the um the beauty of what's happening at the moment and, and what's happening in the Northern Territory 
because of the investment um, from Geoscience Australia in, in key areas and from our own territory government. And again, just to follow up on Tanya's point about, and I would also put a plea in for ongoing funding. We are, because of uh, the use and the recognition of the value of that pre-competitive uh, geoscience data, the Northern Territory Geological Survey has now been given accelerated um, ongoing funding for the first time in decades because we have also been on that four year um, rotation of going back with a begging bowl to government for the funding. But now we have um, extended high level ongoing funding which allows us to plan better and to work with um, our other jurisdictional partners. We are working with other surveys to make sure again the geoscience data is consistent and to be able to um, leverage with Geoscience Australia for some of these amazing programs which are transformational in terms of our jurisdiction. Great, fantastic start there Doc, well done. And <clears throat> that comment about consistency, it is incredibly important. It's great to see Richard Scott online has made the comment that how important he sees that consistency. And interesting, the other comment you made about um, FAIR and um, it, how really, you know, just how that idea and importance of FAIR data um, has really evolved and is still a journey in many areas. I think we've made some progress and, and we certainly the recognition of that aspiration, but the um, yeah, it is an ongoing journey, isn't it? I think that's fair to say. Uh, sorry, I did promise no bad jokes. Uh, so let's now go to David and David coming from coming from industry, it'd be great to hear your perspective. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And, and look, echo many of the messages that Tanya and Dot put forward. And I, and I think the minister did a, a really good job you know, relatively new in the new in the role, I'm really really impressed with um, you know how uh, Mr. King has shown up at a few places where I've had the opportunity to hear him speak, and that's just so important for us. But what what I'd add, I, I guess, the data. I mean, fundamentally, geologists, you know, w without it, we're model driven, and and we could argue for days or or weeks. I mean, it's probably some arguments that have been going for centuries um, that that don't get resolved until there are really data available to substantiate models or otherwise. You know, and, and the good thing about geologists, I think they're generally pretty ready to throw some models out and, and accept new ones. Um, and so that's the, the kind of data that come here that can go against the grain, go against conventional wisdom, be purely fundamental for the sake of science to some extent. Obviously, there's an application focus in the name exploring for the future, but it, it doesn't have to necessarily be testing tried and, and true methodologies. And I think you see the greatest value in examples like the, the South Nick and Barclay studies versus and, and not to be critical of the Cooper study that Geoscience Australia did and some really great fundamental technical work, but it's almost eight years behind, um, you know, where the, where the money and investment had gone and it was a trailing piece of work. And some of these really frontier pieces of work have been been leading out in front. So I think, uh, yeah, fully supportive. I think I can speak a little bit to the South Nick example. Uh, you know, as an old potential fields geophysicist, uh, I, I do want to give gravity some credit. For, we weren't totally surprised by the uh, presence of a basin in the South Nicholson area, we, we may slightly overplay the new basin um, where we didn't know it was, but the details are what's important. And gravity is, you know, non-deterministic, as we know, and really the seismic data that government got accelerated things that would have taken industry probably another five, six years to get everything in place to go and shoot a survey like that. So you've got five or six years of one time and the value of that is, is almost immeasurable. Um, and the detail that it provided, so the shape of that basin, the structure of that basin, the, the way, um, you know, the way we can see the western margin mirroring some of that eastern margin, we didn't know that from gravity. And so fundamentally, there was huge value that came uh, you know, came from that. So I think that's one area where I've really seen value. I think just going to ages almost every year, I see the data being used, the NT's data in particular, where I'm most familiar, but also Geoscience Australia data in the, in the, in the case of exploring for the future. You, you turn up there and you see the, the people out there putting the capital to work, referencing uh, these data sets and talking about the value they get and that's the proof right and so I think there's probably a great little summary that should come out of ages every year to help the minister understand how this uh, you know how these data are really getting put to work um, and and should continue to 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 um, do so and I think that helps make the case that both Dot and Tanya talked about it if I left with one little um, you know concern for the future I, I think in my space in the hydrocarbon space 
you know, it's a skinny funnel. I think we've got a lot of running room undercover in the mineral space and, and, and the excitement is palpable, right? And the, the amount of, you know, critical minerals references versus, you know, gas. I'd love to do a Google analysis of that. And, and it's like we've fallen off a cliff uh, as if we're at the point of this transition rather than at the start of a journey. And, and I think the real concern for Australia is that we don't have an abundance of places to go and do the frontier pre-competitive data in the hydrocarbon space. And, and that should be a concern because I, I'm not sure we're really having that conversation at the moment. And it's bigger than this panel, but it's um, one that does stress me out. Terrific. Thanks for that, David. Really, um, yeah, strong endorsement of data. Um, and yeah, definitely take on board that, those, that closing point there. Really good one. Um, I've left you till last again, Craig, but don't don't get a complex about this. <laughs> it's actually partly be oh, it's largely because working in groundwater, the whole pre-competitive model is not you know is is not the model that's used. But but there's still that importance of government framework, government data to to contribute there. Would you like to give us a bit of bit of your perspective on that? Yeah, look, I'm um, good. Good point, Steve. So um, obviously I'm from the groundwater sector. Uh, the data sets um, across all of geology do feed in and underpin all of our long-term planning, uh, future planning and so forth. I would make a couple of points at the outset though in terms of the, the value of groundwater and its significance. We know that groundwater supports about 20 to 30 percent of Australia's water supply and it's across mining, agriculture, food production, industry, provision of water supplies in remote areas of Australia. And the other thing that's interesting, the work that Deloitte Access Economics did a few years ago uh, showed that groundwater supports a conservatively estimated $34 billion a year of national economic productivity and activity across those sectors, whether it be mining or agriculture. So that, that is sort of points to scale and, and significance. Obviously, the resources, as we've heard already, the case was put really well, I think, by the Minister and, and Andrew. These resources are inextricably linked they're not separate decoupled uh, entities so the data sets that we're talking about here are as we've heard um, hugely hugely important for supporting greenfields exploration in groundwater in mining in energy and and the linkages between them we've seen great examples in recent years of uh, airborne geophysics for example being brought out of the arsenal to locate uh, additional groundwater resources in regional new south wales uh, as water supplies were threatened. Uh, we've seen great work done on mapping paleo channels and groundwater sources uh, for mining projects in various parts of Australia, but for example, the northern parts of South Australia in the work um, done by the Goiter Institute through the various G-Flows projects. And, and those are just a, a couple examples of where that kind of pre-competitive work feeds into assessments and, and not just for production potential, but also impacts um, potentially of particular industry. So it's both sides of that. I'd also, I think, Andrew, um, Steve, you were alluding to the point that the data sets, these large scale regional data sets uh, have been used in various national assessments. We've seen large scale geology and hydrogeology information feed in and support the bioregional assessments program for impacts of coal seam gas and coal mining on water resources. We've seen, um, again, examples of these large scale data sets feed Feeding in and supporting the geological bioregional assessments uh, for shale gas development and assessment. And, and earlier on, some 12 or 13 years ago, I think it was around 2006, um, these large scale data sets, again, um, underpinning the sustainable yields work. For example, the MDB, Murray Darling Basin Sustainable Yields Project that CSIRO led. So these are just a few examples, but they're, they are crucial. So um, groundwater, as we've also heard, uh, supports uh, the surface water systems and vice versa, groundwater dependent ecosystems. So increasingly, it's no longer just about how much water is in an aquifer, but what are those vital linkages to surface water systems, groundwater dependent ecosystems? How do we manage GDEs? Uh, how do we conjunctively manage surface water and groundwater? I'll, I'll leave it there, Steve. Yeah, no, terrific. Great stuff, Craig. Actually, Martin's asked a Martin Smith online's asked a question direct 
to you from from your comments here and I think it's a really good one especially given that the other panel members have talked about that importance of consistency and uh, consistency in the data across the nation and Martin asks you know what do you see as the biggest challenges to providing a nationally consistent um, picture of Australia's groundwater particularly acknowledging that really a lot of the groundwater work has been very much focused at a at a state state scale um, and, and even a basin or particular agricultural project scale or, or mining project scale? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think there's, there's various data sets that are coming together. Um, for example, the Australian Groundwater Explorer that's being led up and developed out of the Bureau of Meteorology, um, the groundwater data sets that are being uh, de developed and, and worked on and led up by you guys at uh, Geoscience Australia. I think we've still got, Steve, I'd welcome an opinion on it from you at GA, but a, a little bit of work still to start bringing um, the various data sets in the groundwater space together. So certainly there's progress that's been made in the last decade or so, um, probably more that still needs to be done there. One of the big challenges for groundwater assessments, it's good to get the regional assessments at large scale, but many of the questions that we're still asking in hydrogeology and, and in groundwater are around these what happens if we pump here to the to a river um, a kilometre away or to a patch of native vegetation? So often the, the the big data sets need to be scaled or thought through in terms of that scaling and scale reconciliation, and it's still a big challenge for us in in groundwater. Um, a farmer wants to know how much the water level will drop under un, under a farm or in a bore as a result of mining different scales and horses for courses, but uh, some good questions and issues there. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, and I think the thing you've picked up on there, Craig, that's really important is that is scale, you know, and and actually um, answering questions or dealing with, with matters of concern at those different scales, collecting the appropriate data at those scales. And that, you know, that's not just a groundwater thing where we can go from a farm to a to a basin to a, you know kind of continent. It's actually really important in the in the minerals and energy resources areas too. So I saw yep. plenty of nod, nodding from the other panel members that really understood that. And maybe that's a question I'd like to ask the um, the panelists then. Seems we've gone that way um, into scale, and it is a really interesting thing with pre-competitive geoscience because it is designed to be at a scale that's not necessarily right into that you know, exploration camp to direct discovery sort of scale. Do you have any thoughts on perhaps ways that that could be, um, you know, better facilitated or some of the highlights on that, on how that is facilitated? You know, we're seeing fantastic continental scale, big regional maps uh, and, and, and data products that, that are, are absolutely fantastic. But then how do we translate that with scale getting down into more detail? Any comments from any of the panelists around that? Oh, perhaps then, Steve, if no one else wants to jump in, I'll Please make a, I'll make a, a comment. Look, I, I think the mining industry wants to see uh, more pre-competitive geoscience covering a wider part of Australia, and I think that map that Andrew showed with the with the work that's being done. There are, you know, major areas that still need uh, still need to be looked at. So the the data um, the data that uh, that is out there, I think there's there's a lot of data, but we don't see that data coming together well enough. Um, I do think the Geoscience Australia does a good job with states and and territories, but I don't think that we have. Um, the integration of that data occurring well enough to give that big picture and to get that scale across Australia. So mm -hmm. I, I think that I would like to see a movement more to a national uh, library of data being available, um, you know, through Geoscience Australia. And I know that there are there are that each of the states have had a go at it, um, and Geoscience Australia has a small uh, a small um, information base, but I do think that this is an area where greater um, amount of work needs to be done to bring that scale. 
um, because I I believe that you know we've we've talked about a couple we've got uh, a a couple of the tier ones out of the twenty in Australia, but every mining company really does aspire to those big tier one tier two uh, deposits. And to get that, I do think that we we do need to address this this issue of data because we're such a big continent. It's going to be uh, a requirement. Yeah, yeah, it's it's an interesting one that's come up a few times already in this discussion around data and the provision of data. And um, I I take your point, Tanya, that we've still that there is still quite there's quite a journey. I don't want to overuse that term, but there there is still quite a way to go. Um, it'll be really interesting in the next few days. I know that um, Exploring for the Future has put a lot of work in its portal and delivery, um, but there's still plenty of things that, are, that that need to be developed in the future, and I think that's going to be a great thing to, to focus on and think a bit more about over the next couple of days, particularly with the, um, the portal discussion that's coming up. One thing that some of the panellists mentioned uh, in fact, I think it was both Tanya and, and Dot, but but um, David was in pretty strong agreement with a lot of what they were saying, was about de-risking, you know, and, and I think that's a, a really important argument there. Um, but when you talk to people in industry, of course, they'll tell you that the risk profile for for um, exploration and discovery or, or a lot of the work that they do extends even beyond, um, you know, the, the pre-competitive geoscience that's provided traditionally. Do you, what do you see as some of the, the gaps? And it's one thing to see some of those gaps in, in what's being provided, but then, you know, do you think that they're the, they're the gaps that, that perhaps could be looked at in the future? I'll keep that, I won't, I won't drill into that too much more, but I'll keep it open enough that um, give you plenty of scope there. Someone like to um, make a comment around that. I think maybe David, you, you, you look yeah. like you're ready to go. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a, and it's, I think it plays into your previous question about the you know tenement scale versus regional scale versus continent scale, and then um, you know the acceptance of risk and and the approach to de-risk. I mean, the the opportunity for all of us as explorers out out there is accepting the risk. If if there were the low risk opportunities, the, the easy easy opportunities uh, aren't going to you know, bring the high upside that that does drive a lot of uh, you know a lot of what is in in the exploration strategy in both whether it's minerals or, or hydrocarbon. So so I think there's a point at which yeah, government is pretty good at um, not trying to get into the space of de-risking an opportunity you know beyond a reasonable point. And it does get controversial when there's drilling involved. Right? I think I think if it's surface geochem, you know, soil river work, aerial geophysics across a broad number of permits. But when you decide to drill a well, it's going to be in a single spot, um, and it's likely to have a tenement holder over it. If if it's in you know today and it's in the minerals, it's in a corridor where it's been recognised for minerals prospectivity. So you're inevitably likely to be advantaging uh, you know one participant over another, and that is a place I know Geoscience Australia don't you know knowingly or, or proactively step into, and they can weigh the the different geothermal, hydrocarbon, mineral domains against each other. But I, but I think as as the surveys do, you've got to remain wherever possible at that next level up and leave it on the companies to to tie the threads together to decide which risk is acceptable. Um, yeah, if if we ever want to nationalise the industry, then that that would be the time when you, the government's going to go and start testing these things with you know the the higher capital projects that you know drill drill a prospect out. And and I don't, I'm not suggesting that for a second that's the path we want to go down, but I think it picks it pretty well. It keeps it regional, it asks some big questions, um, you know, things like magnetotellurics over a very large scale that, uh, you know, might open up provinces that are undercover at the moment that we aren't even exploring in, you know, you could see huge upside in, in programs like like that, for instance, we're pretty limited, pretty sparse still, despite, you know, I think most explorers would argue that it, it brings, you know, big regional benefit. Um, so I think, I don't think there's a single answer as to you know what what level of de-risking you should be able to do with pre-competitive data. I think if it helps you with your models, your competitive advantage is being able to interpret it better and, and make better decisions and accept accept risks that you can de-risk with the lowest amount of capital and 
you know, move your own portfolio forward. So I, I think the balance is pretty well met, but it's a, it must be a forever intention, I suspect. Yeah. Yep. Any other panelists keen to add to that? A dot? Yep. Yeah, look, it's sort of covering off a lot of the um, points everyone's discussing. I think scale is definitely a challenge, um, but I will also point out that what GS Australia, BMR, AGSO back in the day did was that they collect these regional scale data sets that kicked off um, people collecting more high resolution data sets. After all, that was GS Australia who sort of um, collected that re Australia continent scale geophysics and gravity at a very broad scale, which gives us a context for the framework of the geology. And then the, the state and territory jurisdictions are then um, getting higher resolution data and then industry then gets their more, um, you know, camp to prospect scale. Integrating that data and making it scalable, I absolutely agree. That is that is going to be a golden, the golden aim and the data integration. Well, I would make the point that this kind of follows on what, what David was saying too, is what's happening under EFTF is GS Australia again is taking that continent scale um, attitude to new data sets that um, now that the state and territory jurisdictions are taking on things like the uh, increasing the revolution, um, resolution of the gravity and the magnetics and radiometrics, Geoscience Australia has taken this brave choice in getting these re really regional scale AEM data sets, which is opening up the way people see um, undercover geology, plus the passive seismic, plus, as David was uh, alluding to, the MT. Now, now they're, we're starting on that journey of, of getting those regional scale data sets that allow people who want to look at a more um, more detailed scale to go in and collect that kind of data at the kind of scale that they need. Again, the challenge is to integrate that high resolution data with the regional data so that when people dive into that area, that they can see that data plus integrate it with all the other pre-competitive geoscience data sets that are, that are important to, for, for people to understand the geology, the framework geology and the resource that they're looking for. Mm, yeah. Yeah, no, really good points. Interesting that no one so far has mentioned risks around social license and and you know trust and awareness, and and they are undoubtedly there. So um, I just just wanted to maybe start off with a bit of a comment that one of the things that I've observed with the Exploring for the Future program is that that area of how Geoscience Australia does its pre-competitive geoscience work has really evolved a lot in that area of making sure that there is good engagement and connection and explanation and, and practice with community. You know, we haven't always been perfect there um, and, you know, it's, it's an ongoing challenge, but I, I really feel that the way that this round of Exploring for the Future has included a lot more awareness and project work in, you know, things like those amazing animations that very simply explain the techniques that Geoscience Australia is looking to do and how they're designed to be providing a consistent communication with community, I think, is, is one example of some of that work and the greater engagement with First Nations and, and, and so forth. So interesting that that wasn't mentioned, but I know that both I'm going to put both Tanya and Craig a little on the spot there, that I know that they're things that come up uh, in both of your areas. Oh, Tanya, sorry, someone had to do it with the muting. Oh, I was just offering it up to Craig first, that's all. You go um, for it, Tanya. <laughs> oh, look, I think that, that this is an area um, that is in, incredibly important. And, uh, you know, I think that, the, again, the more information that is there that is narrowing down prospects helps to reduce the... Uh, the the drilling that might be required across an area and that again is adding confidence that there is not as much environmental degradation that is a, that is occurring in any one spot i think that's important in terms of of the footprint of the mining industry the exploration industry overall so i think we're going towards that that's an important point that it, making people aware of that I think the also the the integration of all of those activity activities that we're starting to see leads ultimately to better regional planning 
And then when governments are making policies across Australia and looking at regions, they've got a whole picture. And again, that leads to a better awareness and a better overall view of what the mining industry and any particular company might be doing in um, in a community's backyard. So people want to know that. Um, I also see the power of mapping and the work that 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 is that is occurring through you know exploring for the future the potential to take some social what we see as some of the social issues um, around uh, and I'll use indigenous as a as an um, as a as an area a lot of information around what what might be occurring around sacred sites for instance how that might be. Um, information that can be added on to an overall map of an area so that there's more understanding um, by explorers, by proponents that may have interests in areas. So again, it's it's take it's the overlay of information at a regional level and then down um, at particular uh, areas that just provide confidence to communities, confidence to the Australian community overall, but also helps uh, explorers and you know any company with uh, with what they might be needing to do to add confidence from their perspective on the activities taking place. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you, Tanya. That was really good to hear some of that. What about you, Craig? Uh, yeah, look, I think social license and social license to operate are absolutely crucial uh, and increasingly so. And, and I think everyone would agree with that, I would hope. But um, I think that in having the pre competitive data model, that it provides government, state, territory level, but also the Commonwealth level, that sort of independent trusted advisor role that provides the confidence that Tanya's um, alluding to and talking about as well. So the transparency of the scientific information, um, making the data accessible and available, it's not hidden, um, it's available, anyone can see it, anyone can go and have a look at it, talk about it, um, it's there. Um, and I think it also supports the communication that we need to be having around all of these things in, in groups and that sort of participatory engagement model with science and communities and, and different uh, parts of that coming together. Um, I think that provides a really nice framework to do that, to support confidence, engagement, empowerment, just so important for social license and making sure we're not just doing the technical stuff, but all of the social, the economic, um, environmental as hackneyed as a phrase that is, but getting those things right and and doing that in a, in a way that's really empowered for everyone involved, all stakeholders um, in that in that decision making. Yeah, really good, good addition there, Craig. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm conscious that in chairing this session, one of the most important things I have to do is bring us in on time, and we're already a little bit over time, but. There's been a great little run of questions just come in. So um, if we could just indulge just for a little bit. I'm very conscious Ian Jackson's very patiently had his hand up from an early stage and um, we had hoped that Ian would be able to, to write something in the, in the Q&A there. Maybe what I can suggest is that if Ian um, could maybe put something in and we can, we can follow up on that, I think it's going to be the best way. Um, so I might wrap it up there um, with the questions because we are just that little bit over time. And I also note that um, poor Dot's out in the sun there. It looks like a nice day where you are, Dot, but we should let you get in. Um, so terrific. Um, look, I'd like to wrap up by thanking the panel. I think it's been fantastic. It's funny how fast time flies and with four of you and all of everyone's opinions, but you know, you've really done a great job of providing that stimuli to to really drive some of what people will be thinking about in those next few days. It's not just, um, there's a little bit more to it than just turning up and, and hearing all this good stuff. I think you've provided a little bit about where the value um, is, but also where perhaps some of the considerations for gaps may be. And I know that there's going to be plenty more to explore in those areas. So thank you to um, Tanya, Craig, David and Dot. Thank you very much for your time and, and putting in here. Um, to those of you that are 
um, still online listening. Thank you for engaging with this. I want to highlight that, of course, this showcase continues tomorrow with technical talks on data, toolbox, uh, and geology, and on Wednesday with talks and presentations on mineral, energy, and groundwater systems and resource potential. So a lot to look forward to in those next couple of days. It's a great opportunity to get that very convenient snapshot of the work, but I also encourage uh, engagement and um, people um, particularly um, you know, coming up with questions and comments because that really is useful for Geoscience Australia. And then just to further, um, further highlight that, as I said earlier, Andrew's talk and the slides are available uh, online and also that um, ASIL Allen report. Apparently the initial link that Laura shared with everyone has had a few problems, but um, but it is it is in there on the page um, for the, for this event. So, um, and and I think she did a, a follow up link that should work better. Incredible figures there of you know um, over a thousand dollars for every dollar investment to return to Australia from pre competitive geoscience. I, I can't wait. I haven't read that report yet. I can't wait to see it. So, terrific. Thank you once again. Look forward to the next few days. Um, look forward to seeing you all online again. Thank you very much.